We continue our series in accordance with the scriptures, Christ in the Old Testament. And, and today we're looking at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, which is the call of Abraham. And we really can't understand the call of Abraham or its significance unless we look at what happens just previous to that in what's often called the prehistory uh, in, in the book of Genesis, chapters 1 through 11. And so I want to just run through those really quickly, if I might. Genesis chapter 1 is the big picture of creation. It's, it's the cosmic view of, of creation that happens in six days and the seventh day the Lord rests. And after each day, the Lord said, it was good. It was good. It was good. Until the sixth day when he creates humanity. And then he says, it was very good. Creation is it's wonderful. It's good. It's a perfect setup. And then in Genesis chapter 2, we have the more personal story, the more personal narrative of creation. And uh, here, here we, uh, uh, we learn about Adam and Eve, uh, or a man and woman, and uh, we learn that there is a distinction between human beings and God. This is established here. So in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 2, the Lord commands the man you may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge and good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall die. This is a distinction. This tree is the distinction between God and human beings. Well, of course, in chapter 3, uh, we have the fall, which, which we learn is really an ascent. You know, I mean, the, the serpent comes uh, to Eve and uh, uh, tempts her uh, with uh, that should she eat this fruit from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, verse 5, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Uh, so they succumb, uh, Eve succumbs to this and Adam succumbs to this, and then we have God's judgment, God's curses upon the serpent, upon the woman, and upon the man, and death is introduced. Sin is going to be the problem uh, for humankind, for God's creation, and we see it then growing in chapter 4 in the story of Cain and Abel when the two brothers and Cain murders his brother Abel. Chapter 5, a genealogy from Adam to Noah. Chapter 6 through 9, the story of Noah and the flood. Uh, verses 6 and 7 in chapter 6, the Lord was sorry that he made humankind and it grieved him to his heart I will blot them out he says this is God's initial solution to the problem of sin I will blot them out he says again I am sorry that I made them and of course he does blot them out he saves Noah and his family the only ones everything else is blotted out genealogy in chapter 10 then chapter 11 things should be good now everything had been blotted out right but no it isn't human beings are right back at it in the tower of babel story and they build a tower to the heavens and they want to see god eyeball to eyeball the distinction between creatures and god is still shattered discontentedness with who we are uh, they wanted to look at god square in the eye flood did not fix things the problem of sin was bigger than even God himself realized and so chapter 12 it begins a new day it's a new start because God now in chapter 12 is, is instituting his long range plan of salvation for people a way to fix this problem of sin and he does this by calling a man named Abraham and from that moment on everything changes God tells him go to the land that I will show you this is a command and then there are these promises that go with the command I will make of you a great nation I will bless you and make your name great and you will be a blessing and all the families of the earth shall be blessed this is the first promise of one who is to come through 
the nation begun by Abraham will be one who will become the savior of the world through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. As we think about Christ in the Old Testament, this is the first time that we, that we are told and where it is prophesied that there will be one who comes to repair this problem of sin and death and the power of the devil. God could have given up on humankind. Maybe he should have, but he did not. And the only possible reason that could be is that he loved them. God has love for his creatures. God has love for you and me. And so God devises a plan to save us. Our problem still is discontentedness with God. We, we want to be like God. We want to be God. So the plan will involve a true human being living the way God intended. He will become the new Adam, one without sin. And the curse of death, which should not have been his because he did not sin, this Messiah, Savior, he takes this sin upon himself in our place, in our stead. God's long-range plan is to defeat sin, death, and the power of the devil by the sending of his own son. And now you're going to break for a couple of questions. Uh, take some time to think about them and discuss them. And when you're done, we'll come back. So thank you for taking the time to consider those questions and think about them. I, I, uh, I wonder if we really do uh, find examples in our own lives where we want to be like God. You know, where we express our own discontentedness. Uh, where we have a sense of our own futility with life. Uh, where, where, where we wish we knew all the answers. Where we wish we could solve all of our problems. Um, is this not uh, something that we all can see in ourselves? I, I think that it probably is. When we think about God's frustration level, you know, I mean, sometimes we think, we think, well, God's just this grandpa in the sky, you know, and, and, and nothing bothers him. Well, the scriptures teach something different. Uh, God was so uh, infuriated by the sin of human beings, by the brokenness of humanity in this, this pristine creation that he made, that he, he tried to wipe it out with a flood. And even that didn't work, did it? Um, and it's interesting to me that God then should go back to the drawing board and devise a new plan of a way to fix things. I mean, this says something, doesn't it, about God's investment in us, in humanity in our hearts and lives. I mean, would it not be more natural and more rational uh, for God just to wipe the whole thing out and say, forget it? But no, he doesn't do that. So yes, uh, embedded in this call of Abraham uh, to make of him a great nation, to give him land, uh, to have him uh, be a blessing, and, and, and to promise that through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This is a marvelous, marvelous thing. Uh, not only in this great big cosmic picture of God repairing the whole of the cosmos and the whole of creation that is so precious to him. Not only in that realm, but also in your heart, in, in my heart, in your life in all of our lives, the Lord Jesus comes to repair, to restore, to forgive, and to save. We thank God that he has invested so much into us who are so discontent 
he invests so much into us that he sends his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have eternal life.